Um, I'm going to talk about uh, citizen science, something that I am incredibly passionate about. I love, love, love citizen science. And also one of the, the fun competition things that we had this past year, and we'll have it again. Uh, but we'll talk about bioblitzing and kind of what citizen science is and why it's such a powerful tool, uh, especially right now you know, during a pandemic too, still a powerful tool uh, for many reasons. And with citizen science, um, one of the fun things that, that I think uh, shows up with citizen science is that you don't have to be a scientist to do it. You don't have to be a biologist to do it. You don't have to know anything about anything to participate in it. There's pretty much just one prerequisite to being a citizen scientist or to being involved in this, and that is interest. So interest or curiosity is pretty much the only prerequisite that you need to be active in citizen science. And uh, this, the definition of it, or the defining part of it, it's in the involvement of the public or people in addressing questions, whatever questions there might be. And as I said earlier, to be a citizen scientist, all you really need is interest. And you don't even need to have like a ton of interest. You can might just be partially interested in something. Um, I'll do a general question to the group. And I know I can't see your faces, but I'll assume that all of you are nodding to this, to this question. How many of you have ever been walking outside and you see a plant that you don't know the name of it? Has that ever happened to you in your entire lifetime? Again, I'll assume that everyone is, is nodding their heads, except I see a couple people that have nodded their head know that they know all of the plants. Good for you. Well done. Um, Ricky, I saw you there. I saw you nodding your head now. Um, but to be a citizen scientist, all you need is interest. And a question like that could spark an interest is there's a plant that I don't know, and I would love to know what that is. Or I might be just semi-interested on what that plant is or what the name of that thing is. So that's the only prerequisite. There are a few steps, a few verbs, a few actions that we need to do to participate in this. The, the first one, we know the prerequisite is interest. The first action is exploring. Now, I don't know what happens to us, but something happens that when we grow up, when we become adults, we tend not to flip over logs and go ooh and ah when we see roly polies. But if you're ever out with kids, or if you have kids yourself, or grandchildren, or the stranger's kids, and you see them and they flip over a log and they see a roly poly, they'll go, oh wow, neat, cool. Well, that's the first action to being a citizen scientist, is to re-engage those senses that we had as little kids, perhaps, of going ooh and ah to the neat things that we see outside. And the outdoors is overflowing with cool stuff out there. We just have to change our perspective a little bit. So the first action is exploring, going outside, using your senses. Now, that, that alone, that by itself is a good thing. And I, I hope that all of you get the opportunity, are taking the opportunity to go outside, exploring, and all that sort of stuff. Um, now the different actions that we have, this is as we advance to, be, to being a citizen scientist. So we go outside, we explore, and then we record or we document our findings. Um, as a matter of fact, Terry was talking about Lindheimer, Ferdinand Lindheimer, the, the father of Texas botany. When you read some of his journals or look through some of his, his journals, and I hope that that book has some of his illustrations with it too, as he would keep his journal, he would draw pictures of the various parts of the plants or the different insects that he'd see and make all of these sorts of notes. Well, that's one thing that we can do too. Now, maybe our penmanship might not be quite as, as um, active as his was, but we have different ways of recording things. Some of them may be with a camera. Some of them may be through social media or Facebook. Some of them may be through your little phone, 
You'll take pictures outside. You can share those to friends, show those to family members. Look at the neat thing that I saw. Recording or documenting your findings is the second action in being a citizen scientist. And I hope this never ends for you. This third action is learning, the discovering of what, where, when. Um, if you stop learning, check your pulse. You, you really should check your pulse. If you stop learning, it might be over. So we need to always continue learning. This, this is what helps us grow as naturalists, as just as people. So discovering the what, the where's, the when's, the why's, all of the how's, all of these questions we want to try to address with this. So we're going outside, we're exploring, we're, we're using all of our senses to explore, we're recording what we find, we're learning through that process. And then here is the real power of citizen scientists or citizen science in general, is the contribution. It is sharing your findings, sharing your what you recorded when you were out exploring, sharing those things, what you learned with other people. And if you see this uh, picture, I hope it's moving on your screen. It's a little GIF, a moving image. Um, there's a lovely bird called a dick sizzle. If you're familiar with this bird, uh, it's a, a Blackland prairie or a prairie bird, and it does this literally all day long. Uh, if you've been out to a, a prairie remnant and you've seen or heard dick sizzles, they will not shut up. And it is a beautiful thing. It's beautiful that they just keep singing that they're in a prairie. Well, you're seeing on this image, um, it shows where dick sizzles are seen. And each person that finds a dick sizzle, they put a dot on the map of, I saw this during this time, this was the bird. And the, the date at the bottom, that's how this, the scroll is moving. It's, you can see it's lighting up in different places. Well, what we're seeing is migration. We're seeing the migration of this dick sizzle throughout uh, the United States. And you may not see it just by the single record of it, but the contribution of thousands of peoples making records, we have this lovely picture of where this species is in place and in time and how it changes too. So contribution is the fourth and the most uh, important part of being a citizen scientist is contributing uh, what you find and what you learn with others. I really, really, really wish that we would devote more time to this question. And the question is, who cares? It is a question, and I bring it up a lot. You know, insert whatever topic you want. And then the follow-up question is, who cares? Who cares about this thing or that thing? Who cares about the migration of dick sizzles? maybe no one, maybe someone does. But one of the neat things that I found out with citizen science is that there is relevancy in these observations. And I, I'm gonna spend a little time on this, this circle graph here. And we'll start out with the naturalist. And read the naturalist here as a person that's just interested in something or sees a plant that they don't know the name of or sees a little lizard uh, on the walk, on their morning walk. He, she, or they make an observation of this little lizard, of this dick sizzle, of this little plant that they don't know the name of yet. He, she, or they shares that or contributes that to the general populace, shows it to other people, shows it to the community. The community sees that neat picture, learns a little bit about the cool plant, finds out about the migration of dick sizzles, and they start to care about it, or they advocate for it. Now, I, I know where some of your eyes are going right now. Some of you are sort of rolling your eyes going, oh, okay, yeah, great pipe dream. But I've seen this occur. I have seen this happen, that someone shares an interesting picture, shares an interesting observation, the community gets activated by this, starts to reach out to other folks, they advocate for it the land managers, and read this as park managers, read this as HOA folks, read this as politicians, maybe city council, park boards, whatever it might be, they start to recognize 
not necessarily the neat bird or the neat bug or the lizard, but they recognize the community, the constituency, the voting public. And they start to say, okay, this matters to this group of, of voting folks, and they start to create or manage that habitat based on that advocacy. And it creates this lovely circle of, of policy change, really. Uh, again, I, I can recognize that some people would say, oh, great, what a utopia this would be if this actually happens. But believe it or not, it does. It happens quite a bit, especially here in the Metroplex. People are sharing their observations and the policymakers are recognizing the constituency. The tool that we use or the tool that I use for this is called iNaturalist. Now, I, I can also see a few more eyes rolling here because you probably have heard me, if you've heard me talk before, that I say something about iNaturalist. I am bonkers about this tool. Uh, this is a tremendously powerful, powerful tool. I have a lovely tattoo. It's a lower back tattoo of iNaturalist. Uh, it's a it's a fun thing. I think that those are I don't know a, a thing, um, but I am crazy about this this tool. I don't really have a tattoo of my natural, so I'm thinking about it. Don't know quite where I'm going to place it yet. But this tool of my naturalist incredibly powerful. Uh, for my master's degree, I studied population genetics. I used a DNA sequencer for this, a, a tool that would map out the, the genome, would map out the nucleotides, the building blocks of life. A powerful tool was that GNA, DNA sequencer. In my mind, in my very biased opinion, this is a more powerful tool. iNaturalist, a tremendously powerful tool. What it is, it's uh, it's just a tool. It's just a tool. It's a community. It's a database. It's a network. There's an app for it, a data collector. The unit is an observation. Um, it takes a what did you see, where did you see it, when did you see it, and it contributes that to a bigger picture, to our, our growing body of knowledge. It's not just a picture, but it's actually data. Um, this is a picture that I took on June 9th, 2016 by Cleburne State Park of a lovely little butterfly. Have you seen that butterfly before? Has anybody seen that butterfly? It's a lovely, lovely butterfly called a common buckeye is the name of it. Great butterfly, really, really neat, but I documented it. With that documentation, I have a point. A, a little point that shows in space and in time where that thing was found. Um, you know, it, it may not be relevant right now for the common buckeye, but anytime I talk to some of, well, lack of a better word, old timers that lived in the Metroplex for a while, they tell me about a little lizard that they would play with. This little lizard had horns, almost demonic-like horns on it. You got it, a, a Texas horn lizards. You know, people would tell me about playing with these things. And as I drool with envy, I almost don't believe them. I almost don't believe them because I have looked for horn lizards in the Metroplex. I have looked and looked and looked and looked for horn lizards in the Metroplex and I can't find them. I've got to go way west to see uh, horn, horn lizards. So something has occurred to the environment to the populations, to the species where they're no longer present. So that's one of the reasons that it's so important to collect this data is to compare it with what may or may not be there tomorrow and how those distributions change. Now there is an app for this. And I also don't like to say that iNaturalist is an app. It, it's an app in the same way that Facebook is an app or Twitter is an app or Gmail is an app. There are apps for those things, but there are a lot more than just the app. There is an iNaturalist app. Um, you can see this is on iPhone and Android. If you have a smartphone, uh, this is one of the, the ways to use iNaturalist. Uh, what I typically do is I'll have my camera with me as well. So if there's a faster bug or a bird way off, it's hard to catch a bird with your camera phone unless you kind of throw it up there uh, towards it. 
It does require uh, a login. So once you use this app, you have to log in with a username, a password, all that sort of stuff. As you add data through the app, this is an example of what it is. It, you take a picture through it. It uses a photo voucher or a sound. You can use a sound clip too. I'll take a picture of something and that will be the photo evidence that I use. You can add multiple pictures as you make an observation. This is super important as you probably well know with plants is sometimes if you have just a leaf or just a blade of grass, it's kind of difficult to determine exactly what it is. So multiple pictures, very, very important. Crucial bits of data here. You can see the date, you can see the location. Um, that, that all makes up great data along with that photo evidence. Uh, some people, when they uh, get a hold of this tool, they go find a lot of diversity at the botanic gardens or at the zoo. It, it's true that you can see a lot of diversity there, but they're also behind bars or people have planted those things. So with those cases, we like to put those as captive or cultivated. Not to say that those aren't still influencing the ecosystem. A botanic garden can have some lovely pollinators that come and those are wild. We wanna document those, but the plants that they're coming to that have been cultivated, maybe we wanna, we wanna keep those marked as cultivated. Um, as we document things, we can click on what did we see on these areas. If we know kind of the idea of what it is, like that little uh, plant called yard aster. I knew it was a type of aster, so I put in asteraceae for it. And then we upload it later on on the smartphone. This kind of blows my mind. Uh, I know this is part of when robots are going to take over the world. I recognize that. But the process is kind of cool. You know, it's kind of cool in the meantime before, you know, the, the robot overlords take over. But one of the neat things is I will take a picture of something. I'll click on the suggestions feature. So this is an example. I took a picture of this lovely plant. I clicked on the what did you see view suggestions. It takes that image and it compares those little pixels with millions of other pictures and it gives me suggestions of what I might have seen there. It also uses a little bit of location. So in this case, it said, well, it's probably this genus, and here are the top suggestions, and it has with American trumpet vine that it's seen nearby. So that gives me a little bit more confidence in selecting that suggestion. Again, just a suggestion to it. Taking multiple pictures is important. Now, if, if Ricky were unmuted, and that's okay, I don't want Ricky to be unmuted because I know he would heckle me throughout this. But if Ricky was unmuted right now, I would ask Ricky what kind of tree this was. And Ricky might look at it for a little bit and he'd say, yeah, that's a tree. That's, that's probably a tree. Well, that's about as close as we can get with a picture like this. So we want to take multiple pictures of things. And one of the things that I like about plants is they typically don't mind when we get close to them or when we pick them up or touch them. Uh, some of them bite back, but you know, some of them don't. Uh, that's the fun way to find out which uh, plants sting is by getting stung by them. Uh, with this one, you can see it's a bur oak. So we can see the lovely macrocarpa or large fruit of this bur oak through that picture. So multiple pictures of it. As I mentioned, finding the wild critters and plants, super important. Yes, there are elephants in Fort Worth. There are elephants and giraffes in Dallas. You better believe there are, but well, they're in the zoo. Same thing with our lovely roses. They were placed there uh, by someone typically, at least those weird mutant ones with all the petals. Um, we can also see what we want to look for are some of the wild critters, fox squirrels or henbit. Even though henbit's not a native plant, it pops up everywhere. So we want to document these kind of things. Almost every time when I'm out in the field, I will bring my hands with me. So it's a great built-in scale. So with this little uh, grasshopper up there, you can see that it's not, you know, two feet. You know, it's give or take that long compared to my finger. Um, I've got a friend, he's hardcore. Uh, he actually has tattooed on his finger of a ruler. So in the metric scale, it, it's pretty hardcore. He's, he's kind of an interesting guy, but um, 
and it's not going to be perfect. Like as the skin moves around, it's not going to be calibrated forever. Anyway, whatever. Uh, if you're highfalutin, you can get a little ruler, take it out there in the field, or uh, a unit of measurement. And this is one of the biggest ones that I have working for the state. Uh, that $1 bill next to a bobcat track there. Okay, so all of that was kind of introduction to what is iNaturalist. Now let's talk a little bit about ways that we can use it. And I don't throw around, I don't toss around this word lightly. Revolutionary is a word that I like to use for this. Like them or hate them? Actually, can I ask you, how many times have you been outside in nature having a lovely, lovely day out in nature, listening to the birds, looking at all the pollinators, really enjoying it, and a family comes by, and there are kids that are glued to their devices. Has that ever occurred to you? Have you ever seen that before? And you kind of shake your head and go, kids these days. Uh, before we throw stones at them too, too much, you know, I'm, I'm pretty close to my device. I wonder if I were to think of how much time I spent yesterday in front of a device, be it the computer screen, be it my um, phone screen. And I spent a lot of time here. So rather than being fearful of a device like this, we can use this as a hook to get people engaged in the outdoors. So it's using this modern tool to get people engaged with nature. There is an app for this, but there's also the website. The website of iNaturalist, this is where you can go and interact with other citizen scientists, with other naturalists, other people that are interested in maybe the same sort of stuff that you're interested with. Um, and also, I'll just say this kind of on a personal note. Um, you know, every once in a while, I'll scroll through Facebook or I'll scroll through Twitter, and it's just, it's a bummer. It is a bummer. There is a lot of news going on right now, and it's a bummer. I've got dear friends that live in California. They've showed me their orange pictures. It's a bummer. It is a major bummer to think about some of the stuff going on. With iNaturalist, this is one of the ways that I escape, too, that I will go through and I will look at the beetles of Madagascar. And if just for a moment I can escape and, and enjoy that and see some of these other things, see the people that are also out engaging with nature. So um, it's a fun way to maybe escape or maybe everything else is the distraction and maybe this is what's important. But uh, nature has been really helpful, especially to me during this uh, crazy time. But you can use the website. That's where I go to really engage with more folks. Okay, now let's talk about a, a competition, a bio blitz, a national bio blitz called the City Nature Challenge. The City Nature Challenge, what this is, this was a, for lack of a better word, a competition to see which urban area could make the most citizen scientists and have the most citizen scientists discoveries. Uh, it started out over in California with a competition between two metros, Los Angeles and San Francisco. It started in, in 2016. Was, was organized through the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. And there they had people engage with nature and find out which area would have the most um, engagement and the most participation in it. Just to let you know, Los Angeles won um, all three categories that first year. The next year, in 2017, it went national. And I have a good friend of mine, Richard Smart is his name. He used to work with me when I worked at Brit Botanical Research Institute of Texas. And he laid down the gauntlet. He said, hey, Sam, you know Los Angeles is way better than uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, don't you? And I said, oh, really, Richard? And they said, yeah. We have more nature here. Mm -hmm. We've got more nature. We've got more citizen scientists. We've got more people that care about nature. And I said, oh, really, Richard? Let's see about this. So we participated in it. Dallas-Fort Worth participated in it, the entire metro, which was about nine counties. Parker counted, uh, Parker, Tarrant, Dallas, Rockwall, Coffin. We sort of stretched out a little bit. 
But we, in that first year, had the most observations. We had 23,000, almost 24,000 observations, or dots on the map of where biodiversity was. We had a lot of species there. Houston had the most um, species with almost 2,500, 2,500 species. In 2018, uh, more people got on board and said, whoa, you guys were having fun. Let us play, let us participate in this. 68 cities uh, around the world and quite a few different um, continents, not all the continents, but quite a few uh, participated in this. Out of everybody, there were 17,000 observations, or I'm sorry, 17,000 people participated, almost half a million observations or dots on the map. 8,600 species were found and almost 600 rare or endangered species were found. Um, during this one, San Francisco was really, really angry. So they won in all three categories on this one. Well, good job, San Francisco. We did pretty good though, here in Dallas, Fort Worth in the DFW Metroplex, which does include Parker County. So um, Weatherford was there. I guess the metropolis of, of Brock was, was Brock involved. I think Brock is, is a Parker County still. Anyway, downtown Brock, maybe they had a party or something. Uh, we had 35,000 observations on this four day period of different species here just in the Metroplex. 2,400 species documented. And I, I say these, these numbers and we may or may not have a, a way to relate to these numbers, Think about it for a second. How many species can you name? Off the top of your head, how many species can you name? Okay, fox, squirrel, blue jay, a dandelion. I saw a dandelion once. Um, let's see, I've got three. Well, 2,399 more, and that's how many we documented. A ton of diversity, that's the point. Even in the urban ecosystem, there are little pockets of wildlife, little refuges, uh, refugia here that we have. And we're able to document a lot of it through these events. In 2019, 159 cities or metro or urban areas participated. Uh, almost a million observations, uh, 35,000 people participated, over 1,000, 1,100 rare species, uh, 31,000 species were, were documented. So tremendous, a lot of engagement. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. Seeing the observations from Cape Town was so cool. It was amazing to see the citizen scientists engaged in Cape Town. They had the most observations with 53,000 in four days. They found almost 5,000, well, 4,500 uh, species that they documented. Tremendous. San Francisco, 1,900 people participated in it. We did well too. Uh, almost 37,000 observations, 2,600 species almost. Okay, again, we're, we're at three. We stopped with dandelion. Uh, cardinal, yeah, there's a cardinal. Gray fox, oh yeah, that's gray fox, that's five. 2,000, almost 2,600 more that we need to document all of these. So a lot of diversity that we documented. Here in Texas, we had our own little Texas competition with uh, you know eight other, seven or eight other uh, metros. Dallas, Fort Worth had the most observations. Houston had more species than we did, uh, but Dallas, Fort Worth had the most observations and the most observers with a little more than a thousand people that participated in this. So everybody was super excited. We were planning for 2020. Everybody was on board. We had a whole bunch of other countries. And I always loved doing the, the Zoom. We actually used Zoom back then, uh, you know, in December of last year in January. It was so much fun to hear the different accents of people from Italy, from Russia, from New Zealand, from all of these different areas. And everybody was talking about how great this was going to be. Well, it, it, hopefully you've been following the news. Uh, there's been a global pandemic that has occurred uh, and it sucks. It really, really sucks. So a lot of those, those areas that were, you know, were battling 
this pandemic, they were saying, I don't know if we can participate in this. We have a major lockdown. This was in um, March or so, and especially the folks from Italy. It was just heartbreaking to hear some of them and saying, we are literally not allowed out of our houses. We cannot go out of, out, outside of our houses. So it's gonna be hard for us to participate in this. And as we were organizing our programs, we thought, oh boy, we can't really gather with a big amount of people. We can't have the same sort of bio blitzes that we had. So it had to change a little bit. We no longer called it a competition. Uh, my good friend Richard from Los Angeles and I, you know, we, we put down the gloves for a little bit. We did our vir virtual hug on, on Zoom. And we said, oh, this is not a competition. This is all about engagement, getting people outside if they can go outside or at least getting them engaged in some way with nature. 244 cities participated, almost a million observations, 3,200 species were documented. A lot of people still took the opportunity to engage with nature, even if it was really, really close to home or in home. Um, I don't think we had any bed bugs that were documented in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, so, but you know, nature is inside the house too. It's inside the house. Some really interesting finds, and I won't go through all of these, but one particularly interesting, and I actually talked to this, um, to, or I heard, not to talk personally, but I heard from the family that got uh, in, in Alberta, Can Canada, that saw a bobcat out there chasing a jackrabbit, chasing a jackrabbit and killing it right there in the backyard there in, in the city. So pretty cool stuff that, that folks got to observe. A lot of first time observations, the first time that this species was documented on iNaturalist. Really, really cool, had lots of fun still in, in, that, in, in that, not competition, but really um, celebration of nature. Let me tell you about some of the cool finds that we found in Dallas-Fort Worth or in the Metroplex, again, including Parker County, but all the Metroplex. We found several species of conservation need or conservation concern. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, we call these SGCN, Species of Greatest Conservation Need. Um, the horned lizard is one of these. Um, alligator snapping turtle is another example of this. Well, believe it or not, scissor tail flycatchers are a species of conservation need. And you may say, whoa, 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 I see tons of those in my backyard or in that prairie. They might be locally abundant, but throughout their range, they are really reducing in numbers. They're, they're, quite not as, they're not quite as strong in population wise as they once were. The bumblebees, and this is kind of the plight of a lot of our pollinators, but bumblebees in particular are a species of conservation concern. So it's another species that we are, we're looking at, we're documenting, and it's important, especially important that we document these species so we can see trends as maybe they shift in distribution or whatever it might be. Some other pretty neat finds, and I hope I don't bore you with this part, but as I was looking through the results of it, these were some of the, some of the cool finds that I saw. Um, has anybody here ever seen a Texas blind snake? Uh, here's a little picture that a good friend of mine, Clint King, actually found pretty close to Decatur, just south of Decatur. There, um, actually he lives towards Boyd, but a little bit north where maybe some of you are, if you're joining us here from the Metroplex. Um, but the Texas blind snake, little tiny, tiny snake. They almost look like earthworms. They feed upon the eggs of ants. So that's one of the food sources that they use. They feed on the eggs of ants and little tiny parasites, small things. Did you know that they have an interesting relationship with owls? In particular, screech owls. What screech owls will do is they will find a Texas blind snake, dig through the litter, the leaf litter, grab this little snake and bring it up to their nest. This snake then eats the little parasites in the nest. Is that not amazing? Is that not cool that this owl does this? This owl finds this little snake, takes it up to its nest so that it eats the parasites in the nest. So cool. And we live with this. We share Dallas-Fort Worth with this little snake. 
Um, maybe you're familiar with paintbrushes. You've seen um, sometimes called Indian paintbrushes, Texas paintbrushes, Castalegia is the genus of this. Did you know um, we have pretty much two species here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex? Did you know that they hybridize? Yeah, they hybridize. There was an expert or is an expert, uh, Mark Egger on iNaturalist, that when he looked at uh, this Castalegia, this paintbrush, uh, from uh, Ben Brook around Ben Brook area in South Fort Worth. He said, wow, this is an interesting hybrid of these two species. He even mentions that if, he, if it were to be seen somewhere else, this would be a new species. But since it's in those, that hybrid area, those two species are hybridizing and we have some interesting hybrids like this. Hopefully you're familiar with this little insect. It's called a spittle bug. If you don't know what spittle bugs are, uh, you can't really see them right now. You could maybe see some of the adults right now, but the, the nymphs, the young, do a really, really cool thing. What they do, um, we have them, and uh, Emilda here made uh, an observation of this in um, South Dallas. What they do, these little plant feeding insects, They'll suck up, they have a proboscis that acts kind of like a straw. They'll suck up the juices of plants and then they'll toot little bubbles. They toot these little tiny bubbles. And these little toot bubbles act as a perfect shield, as a little force field that this insect uses to protect itself. So it's, you know, there are different ways to live. This one lives in its own toot bubbles. And that's one of the ways that it uh, survives. As adults, they're actually little hoppers. They're little plant hoppers, so they'll jump around and actually fly too. But as, as nymphs, as the youngsters, they'll live in these little toot bubbles. Some people hate hackberries. Um, and I understand, you know, hackberries, they're sometimes called junk trees. I wouldn't want to live, I wouldn't want to have one close to my house because, you know, a 15 mile an hour wind could maybe knock it down. So they're relatively weak trees, but they are fantastic for wildlife. And in particular, some of the wildlife that uses hackberries are little itty bitty tiny things. These little tiny mites or wasps, a whole bunch of different groups of insects do this, but some of these create little galls, these little tiny, almost tumors on the leaves of our hackberry. Whole bunch of different types of these. I think hackberry has 20, 30 different species just within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex that creates galls on it. So next time you look at a hackberry leaf or hackberry tree, look closely, look closely at those leaves. You'll still see them um, today. You know, if you go out tomorrow and, and look at hackberries, you'll see some of these little tiny structures on them. Those are galls or tumors that the young insect or mite lives inside of that little cavity. And they're all different shapes and sizes. During this four day period, we documented 168 birds. Um, does anybody know what kind of bird this is? Have you ever seen, yes, good, I see a few people that are waving their hands. Yes, I've seen those, yes, yes, yes. If you don't know, I would argue it's one of the cutest little birds, especially when they are young. This bird is a killdeer. It looks like a little puffball with sticks. I mean, it, they are just so, so charming. Uh, both of these were documented during the City Nature Challenge. And that nest, my goodness, first of all, probably pretty easy to make. But, you know, man, just incredible, the camouflage there. So uh, this is a little kill deer. But 168 bird species. Again, my question, how many can you name? How many can you name? And I'm not saying that as though it's like a, a peeing match or anything. You know, like I can name 75 birds. How many can you name? But just how many can you name? Just how many can you name that live here in the Metroplex? It's a challenge. It's a challenge. You know, try to learn some of the new ones that maybe you didn't realize that were here. Another cool find that uh, a good friend of mine, Adam Cochran, found um, the yucca moths. These are fantastic little uh, moths. 
The, um, the female of this moth actually does a weird thing. They have a symbiotic relationship with yucca. If you don't know what yucca is, it's kind of an agave looking plant. It's one of those gotcha plants. It has little spines on it. But what happens is the yucca moths are, are symbiotic. They live with these yucca plants. The female, what she does is she will take a lot of um, the pollen and her eggs and she'll dig into the ovaries of that yucca and she puts in her egg right in through there. So it's kind of artificial insemination that the yucca does, taking with it a lot of pollen, actually putting it right into the, the ovaries with inside the ovule there. So really interesting symbiotic relationship and they were found right here during the City Nature Challenge. It's also very important, uh, citizen science in general, but also during the City Nature Challenge, it was interesting to see some of the new species that we had not documented before. This is one kind of new, interesting one that was found in South Dallas, uh, found in a park in a mode area. This plant species is, the, the common name is striped hawksbeard. It's a Mediterranean species over there in Italy is where it's from. So it's old world species, but it's a new species for Dallas-Fort Worth. And since this, since the City Nature Challenge, I've actually seen it in quite a few parks in Dallas. So getting spread a little bit by mowers. Stay tuned. Stay tuned on this. It might be our new uh, pest or add it to the list of pests. I like to bring up the emerald ash borer. If you have not heard of this, this is a little beetle that um, has invaded the United States. And just recently, it was found in Tarrant County. And it was found by a 10-year-old boy on iNaturalist. He was taking pictures of green beetles. He documented a pretty green one. They are very pretty little beetles. He posted it as beetles. Later on, people identified it as emerald ash borer, and there was a new species documented in Dallas-Fort Worth from a kid using this tool of iNaturalist. Some more cool ones, and I hope you're doing all right bearing with me, because I literally have 2,400 more of these species to go through. Um, golden tortoise beetles. These, these, be these beetles, they can be kind of pests on our sweet potato vines. If you have that sweet potato vine that you, call, that you have in the yard or the flower garden, or if you have um, any of the evening primrose families, not the evening primrose, the, uh, the morning glories, Ipomia, they specialize on those. Did you know that the larva have an interesting defense? What the larva, the, the young of these beetles do is they have fecal shields. And these fecal shields are just that. They defecate and sort of hold their little turds out as a shield, as a shield to prevent things from eating them. And it's really fascinating when you see them because they'll actually move that shield along with you. So a really neat thing. Did you know that we share the Metroplex with these species? We actually have quite a few species of tortoise beetles in the DFW Metroplex. Another cool thing, again, we share, we share this ecosystem with all these species. How many can you name? 356 species of butterflies and moths were observed during four days during the City Nature Challenge. A couple really neat ones there, uh, zebra condystyles. We have some sort of a, a, a leaf miner moth. We have um, a specter moth, a double line chocolate moth. Tremendous diversity that we had. In four days, we documented 356 species of butterflies and moths tremendous diversity. And if you're out making observations with iNaturalist, evidence can work too. So uh, my wife Elizabeth, she took this picture of a, a tree that had some bark chewed off of it. Well, most of you would say, aha, huh, a beaver has been here. Well, that evidence can work as an observation that this species was here. Uh, you can also use scat the poop right there of a coyote or the, the, the footprint, the tracks of a raccoon.
pretty neat ways that we can use this evidence of, uh, of the species, evidence of the critter was there, we can use that as an observation too. So some ways that we can use this data or the relevancy of this. I use it so much as an urban wildlife biologist to show the evidence of a constituency. I mentioned earlier about you know, the pipe dreams of this. Let me tell you, every time I go to talk to a city council, to a park board, I bring that data with me. I bring it with me to show them, the, the park board, the park manager, the, whoever is doing maintenance of it, I bring that with them to show, to show them the species, to show them all the species of it. Maybe they don't care about that, but they definitely pay attention when they see that 50 people have gone to this park to look for birds or look for bugs. They recognizing, aha, this is the kind of people that are using this park. We need to change our management for those, that naturalist community. You can also use it to find areas of high biodiversity, generate that local interest. Um, I use it again for land management uh, guidance. You know, when I worked at uh, my previous job was working at the city of Mansfield, which is a municipality just south of Arlington. I worked as a nature educator. And as a nature educator, I would work with school kiddos, and in particular, some kindergartners. And I joke that the kindergartners prepared me for working with city council. It prepared me for working with the park boards, with the city manager. Sometimes I got to jiggle my keys to get their attention. But they also were impressed, the kindergartners and the city council, by all the pictures, all the diversity in an area. They're impressed by that. And, and believe it or not, we've made some really meaningful, relevant, important management decisions and guidance with that. So let's look at a local instance. Uh, Soldier Springs Park. Has anybody ever been to Soldier Springs Park there in Weatherford? Um, if you go to the library, it's not too far from that, the Weatherford Public Library. This is a fantastic park. If you've not been, I highly suggest going to Soldier Springs Park. So far, we, and I say we collectively, 18 people, have gone out to make observations. We've made almost 500 observations of 250, give or take 250 species here. We see the locations of these species on the map. I don't know if anybody is working on a field guide, you know, a print field guide of the plants of Soldier Spring Park. I don't think so. I don't know how well of a seller that will be. I would probably buy it, but I don't know of anybody working on, on a book on that. With iNaturalist, we have a digital field guide, a filterable digital field guide. The next generation of naturalists, like it or not, they're not going to get field. They're not going to get paper cuts on the field guides that maybe you and I did when we were going out learning stuff about bugs or birds. They're going to be using devices. They're going to be using devices like this. So in this case, I can go to Soldier Springs Park there in Weatherford, and I have my plant list. I have my plant guide with pictures of the different species that are out there. Also, interestingly enough. As far as I know, this is the only public park that has that um, Comanche Peak Prairie Clover, Dahlia reversionii, crazy about this plant. I love this plant. But if you go to that park right there by the sign, Soldier Springs Park, there's a big wooden sign there. Just in front of that is a small population of that rare plant that's found just in North Central Texas, just in a few counties. So it's one of the ways that you can use this uh, you know, as you're out exploring too. Um, sort of a funny thing, but when I give presentations on how to use iNaturalist, it's kind of like if I were to give a presentation on how to play baseball. I could give you the rules. I could show you what a bat looks like. I could show you what a glove looks like. I could tell you all about the rules. I could go into the history of all that. But really, what's the best way to learn baseball? Well, you go out and you throw the ball. You go out and you start hitting it a little bit. Practicing is one of the best ways to learn this tool if you want to. NIPSOT, Native Plant Society of Texas, is going to be doing a bio blitz. We are going to have this um, socially distant bio blitz, this virtual bio blitz, throughout the state of Texas between uh, October 18th and October 24th. 
We are asking people to go out and make observations of plants. Go out, go make some observations of plants. We in particular are focused on the wild plants. So not necessarily the ones that you got at uh, Discovery Gardens today, not those obedient plants that you're putting uh, in there, which I love obedient plants, love those plants. But we don't necessarily want those, we want the wild things, maybe the weeds that are popping up uh, by that obedient plant. Do you know all the names of the weeds? Well, by learning the names, it's kind of like getting a password or the key to the lock. Once you open that up with the key to lock, it opens up the room of knowledge for that, that species. So learning the names of these is a fun thing. Again, we're going to ask folks to, uh, and you don't have to sign up or anything like that. If you go out and make observations, it automatically is grabbed by this project. So no extra steps. Just make an observation somewhere in Texas. Hopefully you're somewhere in Texas. Uh, during this time, make observations of plants and they automatically are added to this project. We're going to use this data. We had one last year to, to see how many species people could document where those species were in, in space and in time, and even providing data to the questions that we have not addressed or not asked yet, or the people that are asking those questions haven't even been born yet. So it pre presents a lot of data that might be usable to, to folks in the future. Uh, with that, boy, I went a little bit long. Forgive me for that. But I would love to um, address any questions. I'm going to do stop sharing my screen. I'm going to go to the chat right now. Um, does anybody have any questions, any comments? Um, Kim Conroe. Hey, Kim, how are you? So good to see you. Even though I'm not seeing you, I just assume that you are there. Um, yes, I always want to know the names of the plants I see. Absolutely. This is another tool that you can use to learn the names of plants. But I also want to emphasize something else, is when you use this tool, especially if you're using the visual suggestions, the what did I see view suggestions, it will give you maybe some suggestions there. And you may ask, well, am I sure? How do I know that it's right there? And the beautiful thing about iNaturalist is there is a, a group of folks of naturalists that are on iNaturalist giving identifications, verifying those things. Now you might also ask, whoa, 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 I made an observation like three months ago and no one has looked at it yet. When I worked at BRIT um, at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, there were boxes on top of the herbaria, on top of the cabinets that had been waiting there for 50 years. So in some of these cases, we need to be a little bit patient. The other thing that I also want to emphasize is it's all based on what kind of evidence you provide. I can't tell you how many times I look at an observation and it's half of a leaf or it's a little portion of a blade of grass. And the question is, what is this? And in some of those cases, I need to provide more evidence. So more pictures of this grass. What are the flowers of this grass? I know uh, Ricky, I assume Ricky is still on here somewhere. I, I'm sure that Ricky has gotten this question, is someone will bring a little piece of grass and say, Ricky, you're an expert, what is this? And Ricky will go, dude, it's a piece of grass. That's about all I can get from that. I, I know, Ricky, you're probably laughing because it's probably very true. Uh, you, you, need, you need a little bit more evidence. You need the flower. You need a little bit more of the habitat. Where did you find it? All that sort of stuff. So as you make observations, the more evidence that you can provide, the more likely there is to be an identification on it. Um, let's see. The status of on... Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Good to see you, my friend. Um, the status of the ongoing BioBlitz. Okay. So if you would like to participate right now, currently, um, the master naturalist, but also really anyone, um, we have a bio blitz that's going on that's opened up just to the six chapters of master naturalist and to the counties that they serve. So if you live within the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex and you make an observation either tonight, there's still, well, there's no more sunlight, but you, we have lamps. So go outside, observe some plants out there. All of those are automatically added to this bio blitz that's currently ongoing. 
And there's a little uh, competition between the master naturalist chapters on which of the six master naturalist chapters can have the most participation, the most observations, the most species, all that. You know, we are, we are funny. You, you, we're really monkeys with clothes. You just sprinkle a little bit, bit of competition on something and we go bonkers. So I love it. I love it. We all win. Um, Fonda. Hey, Fonda. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, do you have a YouTube video on how to do all of this? Technology always makes me cry. Yes, <laughs> Fonda, it's okay. It is okay. And, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up in this virtual frontier. I didn't grow up on the virtual frontier as many of our, perhaps our kids or our grandchildren or the younger generation has. So devices can be challenging for me too. And with us, it's a lot of practice, you know, practice, practice, practice. But yes, there are definitely a lot of guides on iNaturalist on the website. So if you go to iNaturalist, you can go to iNaturalist videos or iNaturalist help, and it gives you videos on exactly how to do all of these things. And, and another thing too that I just need to say is, it can be frustrating to folks. It can be very, very, very frustrating to, to folks. And it's, this is not a cult. This is not a cult that you have to join us on iNaturalist. It's not a cult. Um, and if it's not for you, or if it's not for, if it aggravates you, or if it's not working right, you know, that's, that's okay. It's okay. Still go outside and engage and explore. Have, you know, friends go out with others if you can, if you feel comfortable with it. Uh, go out, stay socially distanced with them, and make some observations along with people. If you have a lot of people wrestling with something at the same time, that's a way to solve some of these problems. But yes, there are a lot of how-to videos on, on using this. Going to iNaturalist.org, that's the website. Um, I didn't mention that. It's a, a nonprofit. It's funded by National Geographic, the National Academy of Sciences, and um, a couple other foundations, National Science Foundation. So it's, it's you know, a big thing. It's a good thing. Uh, totally free stuff. But going on that website, going to the help, going to the videos, that shows you kind of how to participate with it. Uh, Ricky Linux says, you are right. Ricky says he hates when people only give him one blade of grass. I agree, Ricky. I agree. Um, oh, thank you. Hey, Carrie. Good to see you. So good to see you, Carrie. Uh, there's a link that has um, some of that information, the citizen science story that Sam was a part of. Yeah. Um, I've been fortunate to do a lot of media stuff with iNaturalist, trying to um, get people to join the revolution, uh, so to speak, uh, basically just going out and engaging with nature. Um, oh, yes, that town Sendia, so cool. This is a, an eastern daisy, a, a, an Easter daisy found in a few spots. Um, I think Carrie found this in uh, Ben Brook, a limestone cropping outcrop of this. Really, really cool. We're seeing a lot of eyes going out and exploring and sharing these records. It, it's changing the way that we think, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So the more um, engagement that you have, the more uh, participation, the more questions that are addressed by all this. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Um, I hope I didn't bore you too, too much. Um, eight o'clock, that's not too, too bad. Not too bad. We still have several hours that we can go outside with the flashlight, go outside, look for bugs and plants and make at least 50 observations tonight. Uh, Bill. Uh, I do have one more question. I wanted to uh, verify whether or not the uh, uh, cultivated plants are counted in the BioBlitz numbers also. Good question. So I don't think so. I think that we are actually, but I'm not totally sure on that. I'm not totally sure. On the current bio blitz that we're doing right now, currently, we are not, we're excluding the cultivated plants. So we're again asking people to go out and make wild observations. And the reason that we do this, of course, it makes sense with, you know, the zoo critters, but I can take a begonia to Antarctica, you know, if just for a moment, but you wouldn't normally find begonias in Antarctica. In the same manner, um, some of our Texas native plants, like red yucca, um, how many of you have red yucca in your landscaping? Anybody have red yucca? It's a great plant. 
I love red yucca. It is magnificent. It is tough as nails once you get it established. Hummingbirds, have you seen the hummingbirds visit the red yucca? It is magnificent. It is beautiful. In reality, red yucca is only found way over in Del Rio in that little, in Belverde County. That's the only place that you really see it out in the wild, but in cultivation, you see it all over the place. So we don't really want to see that documentation of it. If you're there in Valverde, if you're there at, at Del Rio, absolutely, go document red yucca. I've seen it out in the wild. It's fantastic. Um, but the stuff cultivated, even if it's a native plant in your yard that you have placed there, we're kind of asking us to, um, to focus on some of the wild critters. Does that make sense to, to everybody? Um, I, I hope so. This is a question that we get a lot to is also on restoration projects. Well, what if I've been restoring this prairie in the backyard? And yeah, I threw some seeds out there a couple years ago. Um, I transplanted a couple little blue stem or a couple big blue stem or Indian grass out there, but I haven't watered that in three years, in five years. Is that still cultivated? And this is that lovely gray area on should we call this cultivated, should this not be cultivated? I like to say if it is a, a population or if it's an individual that no longer needs care, that you don't really have to water it at all, if it's outside of its um, general range where you put it into the, to the ground or if it's spreading around, then we want to mark that as, as wild. And I hope that makes sense too. It's a, it's a very gray, gray area there too. Anybody else have any other questions or, or comments? Yeah, Sam, I, uh, I did have one, <clears throat> one question. And the map that you showed of the little bird and the migration, that animated map, yep. can we access those maps on the iNaturalist website? So great question. Um, that was actually using eBird data. So that, that map was a little bit different. It was using eBird data. But you can absolutely uh, use maps like that on iNaturalist. So when you go to the website, inaturalist.org, um, you type in on the species, you type in what you're looking for, like Texas blue bonnet, you put that in the species tab, and then it gives you all the dots where Texas blue bonnet has been found. And you can look at the map there too. You can also filter that map by um, state, if you wanted to look just at in Texas or just at in Oklahoma or wherever it might be, or you can filter it by date too. So if you want to see the blue bonnets, what they're doing in September, um, believe it or not, there are some that are blooming right now. Uh, I have one at Cedar Hill State Park. This blue bonnet, this silly blue bonnet is blooming right now. And, and maybe some of you have some blue bonnets that are blooming too. So we get some of that phenology out of it too that you can filter uh, with that data. So you can absolutely access maps kind of like that, but don't have the moving um, image. Okay. Well, thanks very much. This has been a great presentation for us. Uh, Absolutely. Totally my pleasure. Anyone else have any other thing for Sam tonight? Um, Fonda. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. Oh, dear Marshall. Yes, we miss Marshall so much. Uh, do they want retrospective entries from my husband's old bird pictures? Absolutely. I love it. I love it when people upload pictures of the past. One of my good friends, Greg Lassley is his name. He lives in Austin. He has a picture of himself as a boy, young kid in 1950 of him holding a snake. And he knows exactly where he was. He knows roughly the date too, but rather than this picture of him holding this snake, just collecting digital dust, it is on iNaturalist now of Nerodia rhombifer, of this diamondback water snake at, in Austin in Dripping Springs, actually, on this date in 1950. So we have, we can absolutely use those old records. And it's been particularly fun during this quarantine to see how many people have been uploading pictures from the past. It's been a beautiful thing, actually, that they take their old, in some cases, slides, and they're uploading all of these old images that they know where they were, when they were, um, they know general vicinity of that, and uploading it. Absolutely. That would be a tremendous contribution, Fonda, for some of Marshall's um, 
bird pictures. I remember Marshall showing me um, a bird picture at, one, at a Cross Timbers meeting um, that, that you guys saw together. I don't remember the name of it, but um, I do, I vividly remember seeing that with them. So yeah, he's got a collection of bird shots. And some of you may have pictures from vacations. If you know where you were, you know generally when you were, you've got a piece of data and you can contribute uh, with that little bit of data on iNaturalist too. Well, I think I speak for everyone when we say, I'm ready to go do that. I think a bio blitz would be really fun. It'd be fun to participate in that. And those questions don't seem that hard to answer. After all this pandemic, we're going to be excited to do anything. Good. Yes. I really, really appreciate you coming and presenting it and making it so meaningful. And we're just very pleased that you showed up for us. Thank you so much. Totally my pleasure. Thank you guys so much.